welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today to our ACMW UK Inspire 2020. This is a webinar series on computing for social good. I'm Poonam Yadav, ACMW UK Chair and Lecturer at University of York UK and my co-host today, today is Nastasia Nezrova, Project Coordinator at ACMW UK. I'm very happy to um, invite our speaker, Dr. Diana Andrea um, Popscu. Uh, she is postdoc in Computer Science and Technology Department, well known as Computer Lab, in University of Cambridge, U UK. And today, Andrea, um, Diana is going to speak about performance in the age of cloud computing and edge computing. I'm really excited to hear her presentation. Thank you so much, Diana, for joining us today. And without taking much of our time, I will ask Diana to share her slides and start her presentation. Okay, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here to uh, present. Uh, and thank you, Punam, for inviting uh, me. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, the wor uh, work that I uh, that I worked on like during my PhD, more on, on cloud computing and how this relates to my recent work on edge computing and how uh, different challenges appear um, in this, uh, these two areas. Um, so uh, first, everyone moved to the cloud. All the, um, all the companies have rented cloud computing resources to, uh, for computation and um, large uh, cloud providers have appeared and um, this has uh, led to a, a more uh, centralized approach um, where um, uh, these uh, um, data centers have, um, have um, uh, are running um, the computations for, for our um, services, for, for most of the, the services of, of the, the companies. However, there has been a shift in uh, computation in the in recent times uh, with the advent of, of smart homes, um, which have Internet of Things uh, devices such as uh, smart TVs, um, home personal assistants, and others. And also with um, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, that uh, so self-driving cars, which uh, also need to uh, process a lot of um, of, uh, of data at, at the edge, so um, they become less reliant on on the cloud computing resources. However, these there are these are um, these two um, mediums or areas have have uh, some has some have advantages and disadvantages and uh, challenges to, uh, to be solved from a computation communication perspective. For example, uh, in cloud computing, you have like a homogeneous environment um, with data centers. Um, there are under a single administration, you, um, it's easier to control. You have a lot of computing power, efficient and reliable network. And there's a management tools developed uh, to, to access these resources and to manage, to manage the resources. On the other hand, there's, uh, there are um, certain, um, uh, the, the idea that, that uh, the, the cloud, uh, you send your data to, to the cloud and this might, uh, um, might be a cause for, for concern uh, in terms of privacy. On the other hand, at the edge, um, the, there are, um, the, the environment is more heterogeneous. Um, you have different types of, of devices or computing capabilities. Uh, the, there's a resource constrained um, uh, devices. Uh, there's less reliability in the network to, uh, to communicate. Um, and there's, uh, um, since we have less computing power, and if we want to to have a certain uh, if if a certain um, power um, compute intensive task needs to be carried out, you'd still need to rely on on uh, on cloud services and also for other 
other service, uh, so for other other functionalities, you still need to rely on the cloud services, and and then you have this um, delay, like transmission latency, then transmission delay to to send off the data and receive back the, the answer. On the other hand, you can keep um, the local data close to the user, and for for the tasks that you you do manage to get done at the edge, you do, uh, there will be the results will be. Um, easier to access in terms of um, not having to to uh, get them get the results from the cloud. Um, so um, so yeah, so as I said, um, there are different um, challenges. Um, there are so delayed to access cloud services, but there's a small delay if you use the edge uh, bandwidth. Uh, that you use to upload the data to the cloud, but you use less bandwidth if the processing is done at the edge. In terms of computing power, more computing power in the cloud, but you have resource constrained devices at the edge, and there may be concern for privacy um, if for people that um, would like to keep the, and for applications that want to, to keep the data closer to, to the user at the edge. Um, I'm looking at, at the first three, so computation and communication um, challenges. And I will, uh, I will discuss a bit about um, application performance and what is important in these two environments uh, in the cloud and at the edge for an application. Um, in the cloud network and um, um, and host tag latency can be important for performance as I was showing in the results, but on the other hand, um, you can get as many um, CPUs or um, so uh, compute resources or as much as bandwidth usually as, as you need. So there are there are available. You can um, you can rent these resources. At the edge, um, as I said, there are um, there's there's uh, uh, the transmission um, delay. There's uh, less. Um, there may be um, less bandwidth available to communicate um, um, with other services, and the um, CPU processing power that can affect performance. You have less less uh, less CPU and memory available at the edge on the edge devices. So um, I'm going to. Um, um, focus next on on the first um, so to discuss a bit about uh, latency and um, what uh, um, the how how much is like the late, what types of latencies we discuss within a uh, data center within um, from a, from cloud from a cloud um, for example for a, a, a propagation delay you have a few uh, nanoseconds for for one meter. There are um, low latency NICs with processing up with processing serialization delay of less than one, one microseconds. The switches are also processing the network packets very fast. In depending on the type of switch, a few hundreds of nanoseconds and a few microseconds. As I said, at at the edge, um, there there are additionally these transmission delays of my millis milliseconds. Um, and and there are, are uh, resource constrained devices. Um, so so these challenges, so the, the the problems that needed that are solved in this in these um, areas to improve application performance um, are 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 somehow um, are are you can they are um, linked, but you have different perspectives. They are um, uh, different perspectives and different orders of magnitude. Um, and I will start with discussing, um, I will discuss a few um, case studies. Um, and uh, first I will discuss how latency impacts application performance in, in the cloud and um, how then I will move to um, to uh, case studies at the edge uh, for um, uh, for related to to again to 
uh, to latency in the communication um, and um, and the, and the processing the CPU uh, processing um, time of given the resource constrained devices. So for the case study in the cloud, I assume that there uh, is sufficient. So as I said, sufficient um, bandwidth and also so. Um, uh, CPU uh, resources and memory resources available for the application. So these are not bottlenecks. And I'm uh, next looking at, at latencies and see if for a distributed application, how the latency impacts the application performance. Um, there are, um, uh, so increased latency can, can uh, I will, I will um, uh, start with um, with um, a new. Um, I will come back to to the previous slide. I will start with um, showing how to, um, uh, an experiment that uh, that uh, we ran to understand uh, what is the order of of uh, magnitude the for the latency that will a network latency that will impact application performance. And we did this through. Um, this is a, a test bed where we studied different applications, distributed applications um, that um, have um, server and uh, clients or um, they have like a master and a worker. So big data processing applications and um, or um, key value stores. And uh, we wanted to see um, whether um, latency uh, in the order of tens to hundreds of microseconds, additional latency on the network impacts application performance and by how much. Uh, we looked at these um, values um, after conducting uh, measurements in different data centers for different, different cloud providers to get a sense of, of the orders of magnitude of, um, of latencies between to uh, rented VMs, virtual machines, um, by sending probes between each other, by between the two. Um, and um, then we, uh, in this setup, we inject a, a set fixed amount of network delay using a hardware appliance. And uh, we use the different types of applications as a key value store, memcached in TensorFlow on a handwritten digit recognition task um, and uh, two other um, machine learning frameworks, threads on, the, on a regression task and uh, again Spark on a different uh, regression um, task, different types of regressions. And uh, on the last column we have the metric which is like the application performance and for each type of application, we uh, looked at uh, what type of um, uh, the performance metric is more suitable. For example, for MemcacheD, it's also suitable uh, the number of queries per second but, and also the, the request um, latency. But on the other hand, for the other three frameworks, the overall training time is um, important and the results are uh, the following for some applications you can see on the x-axis the amount of injected uh, latency um, in microseconds from zero to one millisecond and on the y-axis the normalized performance with one being the baseline and uh, with the rest is uh, how, how uh, what the fraction of the baseline performance uh, we, we got for each experiment. Um, so for each experiment, we, we um, introduced this uh, amount of uh, delay and we measured the performance of the application. And we can see that for some applications are very latency sensitive, so such, such as MemcacheD and uh, strands. Um, some are um, so-and-so affected, but still 
um, DNS and uh, the TensorFlow, um, where we used um, synchronous uh, uh, training. And while on the other hand, um, Spark is, is not uh, that, that affected, sparking the green line. And um, in this case, we can see that, so the applications react differently to uh, network latency. And we can see the scale of, of the uh, amount of latency that we injected. And um, this is, uh, um, this causes uh, this, uh, the cause for this um, results are application dependent, but um, um, as I said, so TensorFlow and Strats are used synchronous training. Um, MemCached is also um, has a synchronous pattern where you have to send the request and wait for the reply. So every additional latency, every additional delay is important. Whereas Spark is um, the way it is written is can um, does not observe this um, the way the application is written does not observe this uh, small um, amounts of additional latency does not degrade performance. But as, as can be seen for the green line, when you get to one millisecond, you already start seeing that um, the training time takes, uh, takes, takes longer because of increased uh, latency. So now that we have this, um, this relationship uh, between application performance and network latency, um, we, we look at um, how to use this to mitigate the effects of additional latency. So we fit a curve to the observed results. And um, for small latency values, the model can be assimilated to a const constant function whose value is the baseline performance. And um, for each application, you have um, on the x-axis the added delay, on the y-axis the normalized performance. So uh, knowing by how much the additional latency increases, uh, uh, decreases the performance. Um, we can think of how to use this, um, this uh, relationship, these functions between late additional latency application performance to um, mitigate uh, potential increases in latency in a data center environment. And similarly for TensorFlow and Spark. Um, and we do this um, through uh, cluster scheduling. Uh, traditionally, cluster scheduling looks at uh, the resource requirements of the application, a number of cores, memory, disk, network bandwidth. As I said, this we assume in this case that, and in general, it's in data center that we have rented sufficient um, um, resources that these do not uh, do not um, become a bottleneck, and we also do not look at, at interference between the workloads on the end host interference between the application, different types of applications that may compete for uh, the same hardware resources. So, and um, we, um, and, and in the, the cluster scheduling mechanism, we um, look at uh, the network latency requirements of the application. So um, we look at um, when, a, when the new application uh, comes into the system where to place it on which servers in order to satisfy its, um, its um, network latency requirements in order to achieve uh, this um, desired performance for the application as close to the baseline um, as, as possible. Um, and um, we do this by uh, using um, the uh, functions, so the profiles that we built before for uh, different types of applications. So each application will need to have a certain um, latency uh, a profile as, as we discussed uh, the functions we, that, um, that we discussed previously. And a system, the data center should run the system to measure dynamically the neutral latency between different uh, hosts. And these do form um, the input to um, scheduling policy um, that is implemented on top of um, cluster scheduler called Firmament. 
Um, and I will discuss a bit about um, this cluster scheduling um, mechanism and this cluster scheduling um, uh, framework and, and um, um, uh, the, the algorithm that it uses. Um, the, uh, the cluster scheduling problem is modern, uh, modeled as a, fl uh, a flow network where on the left uh, you have, uh, this is a, a task, part of a, a bigger job. So the second uh, is a job which has two tasks um, that communicate between each other, with, with each other. And these two will be uh, placed on somewhere in the data center. And on the right side, there are the machines and um, the arcs between the task and the machine node in the task node and the machine node is whether that task runs on that machine. And to schedule a task on a certain machine, uh, you compute a cost and um, this uh, becomes um, minimum plus max maximum flow problem over a flow network and it is solved um, using standard solvers. Um, now, uh, the cost function is very important. And this is where um, I use, we use um, um, the functions, the, the performance functions that were previously determined. So um, having uh, the servers or the master place on a certain, um, um, on a certain uh, host, depending on uh, the latency and, and then there are other, other hosts in which you want to place the remaining tasks of the application. And based on the measured network latency between that host and, and the host that will run the, the root task, which is um, the master or the coordinator or the server, depending on the application type, um, and based on this measurement, you determine use the function using the function, uh, estimate what performance that task would get. So how much, for example, as I said, how, how many queries per second or how long the overall uh, training time, time, time would take. And um, this function is um, the, 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 the cost uh, uh, uses these two, the two inputs that I said, the performance function and uh, the network, the, the output from the network latency measurement system in order to get um, the, the estimated value of the performance. And based on that, the task is uh, scheduled on a certain server. Um, we evaluated uh, the mechanism in simulation um, using um, cluster trace that is available from Google and um, we evaluated and, and uh, some network latency measurements between pairs of VMs from different data centers, uh, from different cloud providers. Um, and we evaluated the average application performance. So um, to, um, to understand how, um, to, uh, to, to see whether the, the mechanism improves over um, over other uh, cluster scheduling policies, whether the, our policy improves over other cluster scheduling policies. We assume that the tasks that are in this trace um, have uh, a performance uh, model uh, or performance function as the ones that we uh, determined experimentally. And as a result, we can see that um, the policy no more improves uh, compared to a random placement policy or to a load spreading, so which is like a, a load balancing mechanism. It improves, uh, so the load balancing, it, uh, it places the tasks uh, in order to, to uh, so across uh, different hosts in order to have, uh, to not overload, overload certain, um, certain um, machines. Um, so it improves by 13% uh, and by uh, in one, if we don't, um, if we don't um, 
my great um, tasks. Um, and in the second case, by 42%, if we migrate tasks, so, so at some point you, uh, at, the, at, the, at the onset, a certain placement it looks good, but uh, over time, the latency increases, the network, network conditions in the data center due to increased utilization or failure de uh, degrade. Uh, congestion, have congestion, and then uh, latency increases. So at that point, it's better to migrate the task to a different placement. And this is when you get an overall, over the simulation, 42% improvement, because this accounts for uh, that the, the placement is, uh, is not fixed throughout, um, throughout the, um, the life of, of the, the task. Um, so, so um, what, um, here I, I, I discussed about um, challenges in improving application performance in data centers. And I looked at uh, latencies, like very small latencies in the order of tens of microseconds uh, to hundreds of microseconds that can improve, uh, that can decrease application performance. And we have seen in, in one of the slides by 20%, 30%, or even more, uh, uh, depending on the application type. On the other hand, uh, for edge computing, we have, as I said, different challenges. And um, different challenges um, for um, bandwidth, uh, transmission, delay, reliability, uh, resource constraint, device scalability, many, many other challenges. And, um, on, uh, and here, um, we, we're talking about different types of, of um, of, of numbers compared to a data center. And, uh, um, and here I'm talking about two use cases for a smart home use case uh, where we uh, were look, uh, looking at um, um, Internet of Things uh, device classification. So to determine the type of um, device uh, based on the network traffic um the and the machine learning there's a machine learning model that would determine based on the network traffic the type of device needs to be uh, small enough to run on an edge device with constrained memory and power, cpu power on um, one gigabyte for um raspberry pi 3b plus and four gigabytes for raspberry pi 4 in terms of memory and we, the model is a random forest classifier, and um, and we train train the models on two weeks of data, and we then uh, this model runs on the Raspberry Pi to determine um, to to classify uh, the network flows, and we look at the inference speed. And um, the the model has been um, optimized to um, to have good accuracy, but also a size that fits the Raspberry Pi's RAM. Uh, in a data center, you may have just left it as, as it was um, when it was trained. Um, if it were, it, if, for example, for the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, it went over one gigabyte of RAM, so it, it, it couldn't even be, uh, it couldn't run. Uh, so this is one of the first challenges that appears in, in edge computing. And, and then, then you have the trade-off between an accuracy and the size of a model that needs to be taken into account. But also there are different, uh, different uh, hardware platforms. And here we can see uh, for a comparison of how long it takes to run the same models on different types of Raspberry Pis. Um, on the column, we have the number of samples, so the number of inference uh, inference runs on one network flow, so the number of flows that are classified. And you can see that there's a, um, uh, there's a considerable difference between the, the type of, of Raspberry Pis and uh, the inference runs faster on, on Raspberry Pi 4. And this is um, just one, one um, um, example of of, um, of, of the challenges uh, at the edge. And um, I've, I talked about inference, so um, 
so running uh, inference uh, on a smart device, uh, sorry, on a edge device. Um, but next, we can also look at training machine learning models on an edge device. And in this context, um, you do what uh, it's done, uh, this is done uh, through what is called, um, the, the, meta, the paradigm is called federated learning, where you do uh, model training on edge devices and while keeping the training data at the edge. Um, it can be seen here in the, um, in the um, uh, drawing. Uh, there's a central server which runs a federated learning coordinator and there are the edge devices um, that uh, train uh, model at, uh, at the edge and then they synchronize, um, uh, they send their updates, their model updates to the coordinator and um, it aggregates the, the updates and then, uh, then the federated uh, learning coordinator sends back the updated model. And here we can have, um, there are different challenges um, regarding model distribution, uh, communication of the device state when they should be training or not, um, and in general the communication and uh, between and the delay um, between the communication between the edge devices and the coordinator. I'm going to skip the the architecture and I'm just going to discuss uh, uh, briefly some uh, results on a testbed. So for um, fully connected neural network uh, for a normally detection task, task on uh, network flows um, where with two edge devices, two Raspberry Pis that run and that uh, do training at, at the edge. Um, there, uh, there are um, some interesting uh, results. Of course, the bandwidth uh, depends on the model size number of rounds and number of clients. Whereas round is the, um, so that the iteration is a part of the computation of training the model on an edge device and the round imply, um, is, uh, in, encompasses like the, the communication with the coordinator, uh, as I discussed back and forth. And you can see in the two uh, yellow rows that more rounds increase the, the training time due to additional communication even though, so we have the same number of iteration, but we, uh, sorry, the total, same number of total iteration, but different number of iteration per round. And this um, influences the training time. So the overall, the overall training time uh, due to additional communication and between the edge devices that run, uh, that run uh, the training and the coordinator. So between the, uh, the clients and the the, co the the clients of the federated learning clients and the federated learning coordinator, and um, this is a, again um, a problem that that need that is uh, that uh, that needs to be to to be addressed and to to understand the the trade offs um, between um, computation and, and uh, communication. To conclude. Uh, there are different challenges in improve, for improving in perf performance in the cloud and at the edge. And um, um, there we need to uh, look into finding the best trade-off between computation in the cloud and at the edge, how much is offloaded to the edge, what type of computation is offloaded at the edge, uh, the, um, the type of devices, since they are heterogeneous, um, the, um, uh, that they're, uh, they have the fact that they are resource constrained um, and in general they are not under a single um, a single authority as, as it happens in a data center and uh, finding the best trade of it, uh, for communication between between the cloud cloud and the edge and the, um, how often to communicate what to communicate and um, um, uh, the, the, the type of um, uh, um, uh, data that is exchanged 
much for me between the cloud and, and the edge. Um, here uh, there are uh, references about the work, uh, the last work that um, then discussed about federated learning with collaborators from University of Bologna and uh, Punam here from University of York and other people from uh, University of Cambridge. Then uh, the work on um, on IoT device identification from um, in collaboration done with um, with the uh, Imperial College London and uh, the rest um, of the works are uh, from from my uh, my PhD thesis. Uh, and then uh, with the collaborations from uh, University of Cambridge Systems uh, Research Group. Um, and uh, with this, I uh, would like to um, thank everyone and I'm happy to take questions.